All right. Hello, everyone. This is Peter Zemsky, uh, Deputy Dean and Dean of Innovation at INSEAD and Strategy Professor. I'm happy to be bringing you today's Tech Talk, where in general we probe the frontiers of practice in tech, digital, um, innovation, and entrepreneurship, really the forces that are deconstructing and reconstructing business and society today. Um, all right. So on today's webinar, uh, really looking forward to this one as we kick off the summer. Um, in terms of themes, um, one big one is obviously innovation. Um, again, we're living in an age of transformation, digital, data and analytics, sustainability, remote work, deglobalization. So much change means what? Huge opportunities for innovation um, becomes really important. Um, and secondly, I'm very excited about today because this is the start of our women in tech um, series as well, where we're really looking at some of the most dynamic leading women in tech um, on these critical themes of our age. And so it's very, very appropriate that we kick off with Lucy Cooper, head of innovation at Accenture Europe. Um, very dynamic, very um, engaged part of the innovation community in Europe and globally. Um, recent, she's one of the WEF World Economic Forum's global shapers. Um, she's out there doing not only lots of thought leadership, but also interviewing lots of people in the space, a blogger for Huffington Post. Um, Lucy, welcome. So happy to have you with us today. Thank you, Peter. Although I have to make one correction. As of March this year, I am a WEF Young Global Leader. So uh, uh -huh. I graduated the Global Shapers about five years ago, but that, as of March, I'm a Young Global That's Leader. Awesome. It is well, great to be here. So thank you. Really good. Um, okay, so let's get to know you a little bit. So tell us you know, a bit about um, wh what does it mean to be head of innovation? What do you do in a week? But, but also, what do you bring to Accenture? Here you are, the youngest member of the leadership team. What are you, what are you bringing to your role from your background and, and to the leadership team at Accenture? Yeah, I, Peter said to everybody, I'm really interested in what you do with your week. So I went away and gave that one some thought. Um, I do, I try and break my week up into what I call the four C's. Um, I try and do about, uh, you know, 30, 30, 30, and then 10 on the last one. Um, on weeks like this, I don't quite get it right. I was saying to Peter before, I've uh, been on Mobile World Congress twice this week and been doing too much of one of those, but I do four things. I do cl clients, uh, and I call that bringing, bringing clients courage. So I, I am a practitioner uh, like any of the consultants on this phone. Um, you know, we are, I'm working on projects at the moment that include um, helping a mining company launch a hydrogen business, helping a telecom company launch a digital health business, helping a bank launch a new proposition, helping an insurance company launch a fitness platform. So those are kind of some of the things I do. So I, I, I'm a growth person. I'll tell you a little bit why in a minute. Um, then I try and spend about 25-30% of my week on, on curiosity, so doing things like this, learning from others, being able, you know, I am only good at my job if I'm reading as much as I can about what's going on in the world and trying to synthesize that and bring that to be relevant to my clients. Um, the la third thing I do is team collaboration, so collaboration is the third C, so I spend, you know, good third of my time with my team, uh, trying to bring them courage, make them brave, help them de-risk things inside and outside Accenture and give them permission to uh, be what we call impactioners, uh, impact action and pioneers is what we want from our innovators. So we call ourselves the impactioners and giving them permission to do that. And then the fourth C is communicating internally and externally, things like this, trying to get the word out on what we do. Um, and so that's how I break my week up. I try and keep those things fairly even, and sometimes I'm, some weeks I'm better than others. Um, one follow-up yeah. question. I was super curious. Obviously, you're not specializing by industry. So when you, uh, you how do you like, you like to mix up different industries and clients, or how do you think about that? Yes, I do. Um, so I was a consultant and then I was an entrepreneur. I went through Y Combinator and ran a company on the West Coast, sold that, then was a venture capitalist in-house before setting up an innovation consultancy before returning to Accenture. So I would say my specialism is growth. Like, how do you help corporates grow? Like, really, how do I add an extra billion dollars to my top line revenue? And we can talk a little bit about that today. A lot of corporates will confuse cost and growth. They'll tell you they want to grow and what they actually want you to do is help them manage costs better. We do that at Accenture Innovation. My personal 
expertise is on the growth side. So I don't focus so much on industry. And the reason why I don't focus so much on industry is because you get a lot of ideas from other industries that you can apply if you have just a little bit of courage to your own industry. So I have um, a meeting with the board of a, a Italian bank coming up in a couple of weeks. We'll be talking to them about CRISPR's new news that they've actually finally edited a human gene inside the body. We'll be talking to them about the arrival car startup in London, which is trying to create autonomous cars purely for ride sharing. So we're going to be taking a whole bunch of stuff that you wouldn't normally say an insurer would care about and go and talk to them about why we think that's really important. And that's why I'm industry agnostic, also because I've never spent 10 years in an industry. So I'm not going to out industry an industry person. The value add that I bring uh, is, is to talk to them about where do you get impact and what does growth really mean? I have, of course, huge and wonderful industry experts on my team that can come and help me look good when the time is needed. What about, so one of the things you bring is, you know, a background out of Y Combinator and that community. How do you think about, you know, for your, these big clients that you're advising, what can they take from that kind of, you know, Silicon Valley playbook and what can they not? How do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it's a really great question. And I think we see a graveyard of innovation um, mistakes from corporates who have tried to too directly take the startup world into the corporate with their you know, accelerator programs or their incubator programs or their strategic minority investments. And then they look back over five years time and they say, there's no value from here. Why is that? And I think COVID has, and we can talk about the, what the role of the pandemic and how that's been a game changer for innovation in a minute. But one of the things that it's really bumped to the forefront is actually corporate innovation has been largely ineffective over the last 10 years. And that's because they've been trying to take too much of the, the, the fun stuff from Silicon Valley rather than the right stuff. So what can you take from startups? You can take their, their attitude towards culture, their attitude towards growth, how they measure growth, what metrics they use to understand is their product actually getting any traction in the market. You can take um, how they scan and look at a market and you can take where the capital is going. So you can actually be very useful to corporates by saying, you need to extend your value chain out of supermarkets and into food technology. Here's where all the capital is going. And this is how we would advise you to grow. What they shouldn't be taking is trying to replicate, rebuild, you know, or reimagine something that's going on in the startup community into, into their corporate. And they shouldn't be trying to subsume corporate ways or corporate companies into, uh, sorry, startup ways or startup companies into a corporate, because nine times out of 10, that's not going to work. And actually what you're going to end up doing is destroying any of the value from that startup in, in the process. And so you've got to be quite strict about what you can take and what you can learn and what you can't take and what you can't learn. And corporates should be better at using, and this is one of the things we teach, at using the competitive and corporate advantages they have to lend themselves and think of themselves as going into an ecosystem that includes platform companies, startups, venture capitalists, whatever, and saying, hey, you do all the things you do really well. We've got scale. We can get you to 60 million or 100 million customers. You know, we've got a balance sheet. We can lend against that. We've got a brilliant R&D department and using those competitive advantages and worry less about needing to like out innovate the most innovative places and companies in the world. Wow, so much that we can unpack in that, including I, I think the whole theme about effective collaboration between traditional and tech and how, how do you think about that? But the other thing I'd like to unpack now is, you know, where is the innovation space today? And as you alluded to, the pandemic has sh shaken things up. So, yeah. so what has that done to, to innovation? And, and how is innovation, again, interacting with these other big mega trends that have been accelerated, sustainability, deglobalization, um, obviously digital. Um, what are you seeing today? Yeah, so I mean, the pandemic has been a really fascinating one for innovation. I mean, if we put aside the unbelievable pain and suffering that we've all been through for the last year and focus on what we've learned for business, we actually at Accenture, just by sheer coincidence, when I came into the role, we've never really gone and asked our clients at large, what were, they, what were their plans for innovation? And under the new Accenture model, I said, well, I, I would like to find out what, what clients in Europe want to do with innovation. So in January 2020, we went out for a survey and the results came back literally 
in the middle of February, beginning middle of February, and we started writing this report and then the pandemic hit. And what we heard in January 2020, I'm gonna cut my budgets to innovation. What we've seen 12 months later is an unbelievable renaissance and resurgence in innovation, but it's not the same kind of innovation going into the pandemic. So it has been a game changer for innovation, and I think in a really wonderful way, but there's going to be a lot of resetting and renewing around innovation. So before the pandemic, this is kind of what corporate innovation looked like. I'll have some kind of startup open innovation program. I'll have some kind of culture, hackathon, training. Let's make everybody at my corporate innovators. Uh, we'll have potentially an innovation department, but potentially not. It'll be underfunded. It won't have the right KPIs and it'll be stuck in corporate governance. What happened throughout the pandemic was CEOs were going, okay, I can no longer deliver wholesale to a product. I now need to figure out a way to go D to C and curbside drop off. How do I do that? And they're looking around at their innovation departments and they're going, okay, this, what we, this is not going to help me deliver to curbside. So what we've actually seen is a complete renaissance of innovation, but very focused now. People want to associate innovation with their core adjacent and extended product market and have it really deeply support the corporate strategy of the organization. So now we're seeing innovation for X, right? So companies are coming to us and saying, I need you to help me innovate in three areas, right? I'm making it up e-commerce, and channels could be one. Sustainability, we'll talk about in a minute, is definitely one we're hearing about a lot. And then there could be some core, core platform replacement innovation. Let's go fully to the cloud. Let's go no code. Let's do it with a whole bunch of partners. So people, leaders are now much more clear in a way they weren't before about what the innovation is for. So that's kind of one thing that we're seeing. So there's been an, a focus and an honesty. The second thing we're seeing is I think leaders are starting, starting to finally understand that innovation actually helps you de-risk, which sounds completely counterintuitive. But one of my peers, uh, I, I was on the phone to a CEO like April 2020 when we were trying to convince them to do this whole big new business model thing. And they were like, oh, I don't know, it's really risky. And he said, well, you can just you can blame the context if it doesn't work. We're living in a pandemic. Let's try the innovation. If it doesn't work, you can say, well, you know, we're living in a pandemic. And and that stuck with me, you know, because he said maybe actually you could say there's never a safer time than to innovate now. But his point was actually innovation is about de-risking and we have all the quotes out there like I didn't fail 10,000 times like you know Thomas Edison I found 10,000 ways you know to make that it doesn't work you know so that the next time I know that it will work and actually corporates can no longer keep spending hundreds of millions of dollars on programs on transformations in the world we're living in today that are untested so innovation is about de-risking. If you do it right, if you say we're going to earn our, own our learnings, we're going to shine a light on what we're doing, we're going to share experimentation, we're going to be deeply transparent, then actually it is about de-risking. And that's that we've seen that mindset shift with leaders since the pandemic. I have to now try multiple different possibilities. And the only way I can do that is through essentially scaled and agile experimentation. Right. So actually, to one again, lots to unpack there. But one thing I heard, I just want to check, is going into the pandemic. The pandemic has accelerated different trends. One thing was people were losing faith, faith with the traditional. Oh, I'm going to pretend to be a Silicon Valley company with yeah. this, you know, and and that was already losing, and that's just been accelerated. That that's what you're seeing. And what about um, in terms of corporations though, um, actually doing this? What's your view, again, going back a little bit to Silicon Valley playbook, all, you talk about experimentation. What's your view on sort of lean startup? Is, should companies be thinking sort of explicitly about how do we test and learn fast? How, how important is that for your thinking on innovation? I think it's the bedrock uh, and you can call it whatever you want. You can call it lean startup. You can call it, you know, Alexander Osterwalder's strategizer lessons. You can call it the Silicon Valley way understanding deeply how to experiment as a 200 or a 300 or a 400,000 person company is very, very difficult to do because corporate culture doesn't want failure to come to the surface. And I don't call it failure, I call it learning. If you spend $100,000 on an experiment that doesn't work, you've learned something. The problem comes with middle management performance achievement is not to surface that learning. 
to like polish the hundred thousand pounds or the dollars that were spent. Oh, we made all of these successes and we did this wonderful thing. And then the learning is lost. And then the company can't change course on its corporate strategy. So actually, yes, you have to learn, but as a corporate or experiment, but as a corporate, what you really have to do, which startups are excused from because there are 10 people or 20 people in, you know, in a shared office somewhere, what corporates really have to get their head around is how do they create the right culture and the right environment for experimentation to take place? How do they reward experimentation? How do they put experimentation on their scorecards? How do they start understanding? I want all of the data from all the experiments that are running. And then my expectation of my leadership team is to do something with that data, to come and change the course of the corporate strategy. We're no longer in a world, this is not gonna be news to anyone, of three to five year future looking strategies. We're in a world of constant scenario planning. And the only way you turn from a scenario plan into a reality in your terms of your corporate strategy is through experimenting is through experimenting with real customers and real data, like polling, you know, when you go out and you say to someone, it, it, would you buy this product? You know, they're all false. And, and we have so much data on this. You tell someone, would you buy this product? And they say, yeah, of course. Then when you ask them to put their credit card down yeah. and spend the 6.99, the answer is no. So the only way to know what they're gonna spend 6.99 on is to put a product in front of them and get them to try it. And there are very clever ways of doing that. You can do it unbranded, you can get partner companies to do it so it's not your logo. You know, there are lots of ways to get around it without putting out 50,000 versions of a logo or something, but yeah. Otherwise you're just asking people, would you like an option to buy this product? Yes, I'd love exactly. that. I, I, I would like to go to the store and see that. that. Yeah, I would maybe what? exercise that option at some point in time. <laughs> in the new, now let's take that though back to Europe. So in the new Accenture organization, you guys have really reorganized with a focus on tech by region. You're, you're leading on innovation in Europe. How, how are European companies doing? Um, where, where do you see them? Um, is the Delta what it needs to be? Uh, so how are European kind of corporate clients doing in innovation? Yes, in this transition, uh, really making the transition, um, the culture changes they need, um, being effective yeah. in it. So actually we did some research on this as well because we researched everything last year. And um, it's a mixed picture, but it's actually quite interesting. So Europe doesn't have so much of a competitive advantage in innovation. So obviously America's got 10 times the capital, Asia's got kind of 10 times the tech IP advancement. Plus if you want to throw in things like, you know, security and privacy in China, which means they get to throw a whole bunch more tech advancement than you would be able to do with things like GDPR in Europe. Anyway, it's a much more simple story over there about the race for the giants, for the VCs. And Europe's kind of stuck in this sort of slightly in-between zone. And there are two things I think that have made a real difference where I think that I'm actually very optimistic. The first one is the EU funds that are coming out of Europe specifically driven towards um, sustainability in the Green Deal. So 1.2 trillion euros, several hundred, you know, several billion, 100 billion of that is towards innovation within those topic areas. And so actually there's a real drive. And with sustainability, green tech, circular economy, net zero, Europe is like eons ahead, like, you know, not even on the same racetrack as North America and the growth markets in terms of our innovation towards those subjects. So lots of the main um, scale ups that we're seeing in electric vehicles, hydrogen, all of these kind of areas are coming out of Europe. And I would urge any leaders that are on this phone to think really about what is your sustainable innovation strategy and how do you take advantage of that market that is being created to really drive a competitive advantage for your business through being a regenerative business because it's mutually exclusive innovation and sustainability now. I would argue you cannot have one without the other. You should not be innovating if you're not being sustainable, you know, if you're not fixing it at this point, you're breaking it. And so I think there's a real opportunity for Europe to lead on that. Um, and the other thing that's quite interesting, and I think the pandemic has really shown this is Europeans have a different social contact contract with government and society than, than the growth markets in Asia and America. And there's an opportunity to reinvent things like what is the role of public service? So I sat on a panel 
a few weeks ago at a conference with an amazing designer who designed the vessel building in Manhattan West and a guy who's building autonomous cars, listening to them talk about smart cities. And one of the things that there was really interesting is they said, you know, we have technologists designing smart cities. So like Google's really involved in the urban planning in San Diego. We have product developers designing, designing urban spaces, whereas before it used to be governments and urban planners. So I think there's real opportunities for things like smart cities, of course, sustainability, getting behind the EU priorities for growth, the future of work, the hybrid era. There is opportunities as a business leader to lead the world and create the value in those kinds of, of subjects. And so we've sort of been stuck a little bit in the middle. And I think um, there are some real green shoots and some opportunities to win. Um, super interesting. Let's I, I let's try a poll. So again, this poll is going to okay. see about our audience's view on what are sort of the underlying capabilities you need to develop to be able to play in the space to to to, to run with these different technologies. Um, so here you go, folks. the The poll is these are all great to have. The question is, if you had a magic wand, what would you prioritize for your organization, um, say over the next year? Where would you really like to build capabilities? Um, two or three, it's a multiple choice option. So we'll give you a second. Um, and and again, the, the idea here is the kind of things that Lucy's talking about, the, the overarching innovation to pull this together builds on these underlying capabilities that you either have or don't in your organization. So. All right, are we about ready to show the results? All right, um, here you go. So um, you get interesting. So software capabilities at the bottom, either because people have them. Um, data and analytics much higher today. Maybe you might want to comment on that, but still right at the top would be not so much the tech stuff, but again, still customer focus, which is interesting. We've been saying it for so long, and yet people still feel the need to do that. And again, agility, rapid learning, um, probably emphasized these days. Um, Lucy, any reactions or, or, or your views? How might your views be similar or different to what the audience has to say? Well, I actually love to see the agility and, and, and the kind of op model needed to be innovative. It's the hardest one, right? So like I go to clients and I like bang my drum of, our procurement here, our risk here, who's here from legal, who's here from finance, because you need these people in the room with you buying into what it is that you're trying to do as a business leader in order to make the change happen, because they can be, as we know, a real, you know, blocker um, if you don't get them on board. And so we've done programs with clients where we'll like ring fence a whole bunch of procurement and we'll give them completely different metrics. So we'll say, instead of doing like minimum cost to acquire X, we'll do time to market, right? So how quickly can you get this whole bunch of partners, ecosystems, startups, whatever, through our system and into our environment so we can start innovating with them? And so it sounds quite simple, but actually no one really does it. And that's the kind of stuff that will make a massive difference. So I was really pleased to see that one. Customer focused innovation, uh, of course, of course, everybody has to be customer focused. It's the or patient or citizen focused. It's what we want. Mm. But I will give you two watch outs. If you do the innovation badly, you're going to get the wrong data about what the customers want. So if you do the innovation without the experimentation, if you do the innovation without the data, if you do the innovation without going and putting a product in a customer's hand, like when I was a, you know, in the startups and say, break this for me and tell me everything that's wrong with it, then you're gonna get the wrong thing back. And so I think, yes, of course, customers, but we have, to, we have to do it in the right way. And the second thing I would say is, and this is where I'm gonna completely just contradict everything I've said, but you know, the old Henry Ford quote of if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse, you know? And I think Elon Musk would have, would, would ascribe to this too. You, there is a point when you have to say, no, listen, we have a hundred years or 50 years or whatever of heritage. We believe we are creating the next frontier of, whatever industry and you know and go for it and then you've got to do it with the customer in mind but waiting for the customer to lead you there can leave you in a pretty lagging position 
Awesome. Um, we'll come back to some of these themes with the audience questions, but I want to put some different topics on the table. Yeah. Um, one is around leadership, um, sure. including who you're leading. So in your role at Accenture, also outside, you interact with a lot of young people. Um, yeah. What are you seeing in terms of changes in the baseline, in terms of the people that organizations are leading? Yeah. So I'll answer, that two ways. I'll answer that two ways. What do I think leadership is and what is different in, gener in, in the generation? So to me, um, leadership is, I saw a brilliant quote today that was like, clarity is great, but actually, you know, clarity is not really going to get you anywhere. And as a leader, you should deliver, you know, you should surround yourself with people who who, who admire and want to have creativity, bravery, curiosity, empathy, trial and error, wisdom, you know, and that will give, you know, that is better than clarity. And I, as a leader, that's kind of what I stand by. I, I want, I want to have all of those words in my team. And I try and role model as many of those as I possibly can. So I try and be brave. I try and be vulnerable. I try and be empathetic. And I try and create that psychological safety. And there's, a, you know, Amy Edmondson from HBS has got a bunch of amazing data and she writes a very eloquently on psychological safety. And we've just bought a company called Fable Plus who do all their research with her about how do you create psychological safety in teams. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. I think, excuse me, coaching is unbelievably important. I try and be a leader coach. I try and be as you know anti-hierarchical as I can. That doesn't mean you go devoid of structure or you know decision making, but to give people a seat at the table because I understand as a young women leader what it's like to have the door slammed in your face and how completely demoralizing that is. And I also understand what it what a difference it made to me getting to where I am today by being given trust and by being given that seat at the table. So Trust is given and lost with me, it's not earned. And I think that's quite an important leadership principle that I live by. I give it to you and then you lose it. You don't have to earn it with me. And I think, you know, words like empathy and psychological safety, we're hearing a lot of. And then on the softer side, less about me as a leader, you know, we're really learning a lot through the pandemic about how employees are fully expectant of employers being there for their whole self. They want the entire experience. They want to be supported you know, when they leave that laptop and they go on to the rest of their life, especially as we've lived through a pandemic, do their company have their back? And so I think that's kind of one thing to hold very much at the center of your mind. In terms of what is the younger generation looking for in leadership, they have completely different expectations. So I would say front of mind is culture, purpose. So what's, what's the purpose of what I'm doing, even if it's getting up and cleaning data, you know, for, for a data or AI company every, every day, and they want to, different leadership attributes. So the, the empathy that we talked about, the, the permission to, to trial and error, that curiosity and creativity and bravery is fully what they're expecting. And then they want leaders to have a different role. They don't see leaders sat up there commanding the organization. There's a brilliant poem um, called The Man in the Arena. This was written, unfortunately, before the days of equality, uh, where it talks about, you know, the, the man in the arena, the one who's you know, face is marred with blood and dust, who gets da kicked down and stands back up and perseveres, that's the person who wins and, and that's the person who leads. And I, I think that's really true with younger generations. You know, if I'm gonna step out here and push the company purpose forward, I expect my leaders to be right next to me and I expect them to be in the arena with me. And you can call that practitioner leaders or you know whatever you want but I think that I think we're really seeing that too. Very interesting um maybe just to connect that all that specifically to the challenge of innovation obviously it, it's very close but imagine you imagine you were advising someone who had had a corporate role who is pivoting into a, a more of an innovation role what kind of things should they keep in mind about how they need to adapt their leadership um, to pr particularly help an organization deliver innovation whatever that might be. Yeah, I mean, we see this actually a lot, Peter. I mean, a lot of the big corporate roles in innovation have been given to someone who had a really track 
good track record of doing something else within the business. Oh, they've been operationally excellent for 25 years. Let's give them innovation, which to me is kind of startling. That's like telling me to go be, you know, an operations director somewhere. It's sort of like you've done really well at innovation. Go do operations. Um, so it is a real challenge. Um, and lots of my clients are people who have been sort of thrust into these roles because I don't want to turn it down. What a wonderful opportunity. And so what, what do I tell them? What do I help them? Well, I would say firstly, you know, get their team and set up a fundamentally different engagement, like rules of engagement. So, okay, you want me to do innovation? It's not going to look like it did before. And set up, be really clear about what you need in terms of permissions and the rules that you can operate in within and outside the corporate that are different. So get a team, get some funding, get some KPIs. If you're not, if you're not on the C-suite, if you're not, if you're not, uh, uh, you know, um, putting yourself into someone in the sweet suite, you're probably doing something quite wrong. Um, so those would be kind of the, the more process driven factors to, to say it really matters, like who's going to be your legal person, be your finance person. And then I think um, the, you know, if you haven't any of you read Carol Dweck's book mindset about growth mindset, like read it. Um, it's about having a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset working off of hypothesis and assumptions, being the learner based. And, and that curiosity and courage is the number one thing I think you've got to have. And it's a very easy thing to say and a very difficult thing to do to sort of be like, always be willing to walk away um, because we all you know, have mortgages and you know, children's school fees, some of us and things like that to pay. But I think it's true. If you wanna be an innovator, if you wanna be an agitator, you cannot become too beholden to someone trying to say to you, no, you've got to do it this way. You've got to be, in, you've got to have that integrity of striving for betterment, striving for progress over perfection, progress over reporting, progress over alignment, and really have the courage of your conviction to like, I would rather spend three years with you or five years with you ex boss trying and learning and progressing the company forward than you know sitting and aligning you know around corporate culture and corporate strategy very interesting makes me think though so what's your line on to what extent should i have this specialist in innovation versus you were saying earlier increasingly innovation needs to go into the core so if you're talking yeah. you know i'm a ceo What's your thought about how much do I need to set up my, my, my chief innovation officer versus how much do I maybe need to change who's leading my business? The debate on this one rages on as always, Peter. I think, it, listen, it really depends. If, I mean, firstly, you have got some very forward thinking boards who are switching out you know, CEOs and other leaders based off of future potential. But assuming that, assuming we're not board members here who can single-handedly go and, you know, change the makeup of a Fortune 500 company, um, then you, you, the reality is that you're unlikely to be changing the C-suite. So let's kind of put that aside. If that is the case, I think, yes, you need someone whose job it is to look after quote unquote innovation. Now, whether you call it innovation or whether you call it growth or new product design or new business model strategy, or it is the chief strategy officer or a version of that as part of their remit, or it's the CEO's job, which we also see quite a lot. I think that's all open for debate. But I think people get a little confused between saying everybody in the company should be encouraged to be innovative and everybody in the company should be delivering new business models. Like, no, of course you don't want everybody in a $100 billion or $50 billion business delivering new business models. Actually, you, you want the majority of those people delivering the core business and the improvements on the core business and those innovations. And you want a few people trialing, erroring, experimenting, you know, using the cap that company public, probably company capital towards trying to find that next set of value. And think of it like, you know, we wouldn't, you know, you don't go to every employee in a company and say, are you a data scientist? No, you must immediately go and get a data science degree. We say we want everybody to have a good understanding of how data can be helpful. We want everybody to have a good understanding of what analytics is and how AI works in their particular business function. We don't want everybody to have a data science degree. And I would say the same thing is true of innovation. Now, where we get 
unstuck a little bit, Peter, is most companies don't have a good understanding of what they what they mean when they say innovation. So what is your innovation agenda? How are you defining innovation? What does it mean to your corporate strategy? And what are the outputs that you expect to see as part of that? Then give someone that job. Now, underneath them and their core team, I think you could very easily say you appoint someone in each business unit. You can, you know, there are lots of kind of different models of central versus, you know, horizontal versus et cetera models. But I think unless you've got a CEO who is pacing their claim on totally pivoting their business model, of which there are some, Bernard Looney at BP is one today, he still has an innovation team, by the way. But what he's done is he said, I'm, my tenure is going to be based on setting this company up for another 100 years. I'm really clear about what innovation means to me. I've got a specialist group of people who are going to help me do it. But by the way, out of my 10 businesses that he has, it's also an expectation of KPIs on every single one of those leaders to innovate. And that's when you start to get quite a well-oiled machine because you have to measure it. Thank you. Very clear. Uh, no follow-up questions on that one. Um, why don't we put our last topic on, on the table, which is um, women in tech. As I said, yeah. this is the first time that we um, um, focus particularly on this topic. So why don't we just flash a few statistics up around women in tech in Europe uh, as we introduce uh, this part of our tech talk series. Um, so here you go. You can see you know, the, the, the representation issue in ICT, in STEM, um, 18% and 34%. Second of three slides on this one. Um, again, um, CTOs in Europe, at least this, this database, one out of 175. Um, of course, here is the, um, the, the just, this is just, you know, capital going to um, ventures with even one female founder. And, and then the last one, um, last slide, is again, women that are in tech re re reporting some level of, of, of discrimination um, and, and looking at, at some of the stats on, on compensation. Um, I don't know, we can ease into that. Maybe just your own story a little bit. You, you, I guess you originally studied politics. How did you come to, come to be in, in, in innovation and tech and any lessons for us from that? Yeah, I actually originally studied law and did one year of law at university and thought, I can't do this for another two years. And so argued my way straight into second year politics. So there you go, politics is probably right. Although judging on our politicians today, please don't associate me with a poli politician. Um, listen, look, I mean, Accenture was amazing as a graduate program and whether it's Accenture or, you know, any consultancy firm or any professional services firm, they're brilliant because if you have no idea what you want to do or who you want to be, which was the case for me, they give you this incredible, exposure and access to you know their clients through the work that you do and that really just helps you get on the job experience of what you like and what you don't like so I guess um I was looking I've always been incredibly curious and I've always been aware that I don't like settling for the status quo and you know breaking orthodoxies at home and at work has always been a favorite kind of thing of mine to do and so I think that really drove me into management consultancy straight out of university. How I ended up then going into tech, I guess, was I just really wanted to make a difference. So the startup that went through Y Combinator was a social enterprise. Uh, we were focusing on the charity sector and I wanted something that was, had a more direct and tangible impact. And by the way, we hear that from people, young people at Accenture, new joiners, every single day. Mm. What is, how are you gonna drive your purpose home? How are you gonna help fix the world's problems? Because that's really what they wanna wake up every single day and do. And the technology sector is actually in a uniquely position, a new sort of unique position in order to be able to support that. So that's, I mean, I just wanted to do something that was much closer to the end product. And I hear this from my, my friends who work in banks all the time, they lose lots of their bankers and they go to Silicon Valley to product companies because they're like, I want to see the impact of my, my work on their customers. And you can agree or disagree with that. So I think that was like what took me from management consultancy into, into the tech world is I just wanted to learn about myself as a leader. I wanted to be without the safety net. And I wanted to kind of have like a direct impact on, on, on society through this social platform that we were launching. And then, you know, kind of wound around for a bit. And I guess what brought me back to Accenture, I think 
was the vision of the leadership and what it is that they are trying to do. I mean, really, we may not get it right or we may not get it wrong, but I really do mean what I say when I said, if you're not fixing the problem at this point, you're breaking it. Like Accenture is genuinely trying to fix the problem. You know, well, the sustainability practice and the programs that we're setting up and the partnerships around driving down energy, you know, um, emissions in data centers and cloud and green IT. You know, I think the other day it came out that like, yes, no travel is wonderful, but technology sector is emitting more energy, you know, than the travel industry. Um, and so we are really trying to fix those problems. And the second reason why I came back to Accenture was because of inclusion and diversity. It's been voted many years running, you know, by Fortune and Forbes as one of the inclusive and diverse firms in the world. And that is true. And I can I can really attest to that. And we can maybe talk a little bit about why that is. But as a woman, as a young woman, representation really matters. And it's not just seeing the people who look and sound like you because it's not just the people who look like you it's the people who sound like you the people who have come from the backgrounds that you can associate yourself with and taken the path through life mm. that you can associate yourself with but it's then watching those people open their mouth and stand up and include and offer you know put those seats at the table for those other human beings and that's that's kind of one of the big parts of mm what made me come back and I and I will shut up in a minute but I do remember a couple of years ago one of one of the the sort of exec committee of Accenture the top five people I had helped present at this super senior event much at the time much more senior than I was and I was sort of hanging I, I got told I'll stay for the rest of the session I was hanging around at the back of the room I got a ping on my phone and it was this person and it said there's a seat next to you next to me here for you please, will you come and sit in it? Mm. And I was like, oh no, I'm just, you know, and this, per this person who was a woman was like, come and sit in it. And she was saying, you have contributed to this content. You have informed these people and educated these people. You deserve this seat at the table. And that might not sound like a big deal, but it is a big deal. And it gives me the permission to go and do that for other people at Accenture. What, what's at stake? So if we don't address this issue, what are, <laughs> what, 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 you know, what, what, what's at stake, I guess? I would say everything. Um, you know, we've had a whole generation of women leave the workforce during the pandemic, a whole generation. 20 years of effort has been undone in 12 months. Doesn't matter what, which data you read, Peter, companies that have women on boards and leadership perform better over the long term. Startups which have female founders return significantly better returns to their investors. You have better family units when the dad stays at home or the dad takes shared parental leave. It's why it's been mandated in the Nordics for so long. It's like you can't solve the world problems that need to be solved on future of work, women's rights, poverty, equality, when you only have half of the voices at the table. You can't solve those problems or actually less than half of the voices because women have privilege too. I'm a white woman. I'm privileged because I'm white. And I'm middle class and I've had an absolutely amazing education. So we have to put all of the voices at the table if we want to solve these problems. And if we don't solve these problems, like I genuinely think society at large is at risk, but I'm, I'm not a pessimist, I'm an optimist. But I think the, the idea of saying we're getting there, we've got our small quota, it's like, it's not enough. You have to you have to overcorrect in order to, to give that, that, that right to the people to be there. And, Diversity is lovely, but inclusion is even more important because if you don't put people, you can put people at the table, but if you don't give, give them permission to speak, then you're not hearing, you're not hearing what they're there to say. And then equity is the other thing that we've really started to look at. And we're all just getting into defining what equity means, but it's basically giving every single person equal footing, right? And so trying to course correct some of those corporate cultures that that may pull back certain groups from having uh, having exactly the same opportunity. Great. I, I want to just invite, let, let's put up one second poll, last poll. But again, around, you know, we would think about what's at stake. What could we do? What levers would do you imagine that we could pull? So if you could pull up the, the second poll um, slide or whatever and the uh, thing. So here we go. Um, again, so these are things that you hear people talking about, obviously getting more um, women um, educated on technology, um, adapting the curriculum um, and, and, and on down. And so pick your, your top two. And then um, again, there's no right answer here, 
and, and but Lucy can then sort of give her perspective. And then I promise we will shift to your questions. So let's just undo this. All right, if we could uh, flash up whatever the results that have come in, that would be really good. Um, Help women, well, I agree with that one. <laughs> I, I mean, I agree with those two two answers for sure. Um, you know, show, showcasing having the women there. I was on a panel at Mobile World Congress this morning and there were four women and one man. And I thought that was amazing in a group of, I think when I went in 2019 and there were 60,000 people there and there was like for every nine men, there was one woman. I thought that was amazing. Um, but it's the inclusiveness. You can't, you can't put these people here as, vaporware as show people you know you put women in PL positions as well as corporate function positions make women the voice of your company put them in the places where the decisions are being made and it's not just senior women too it's if you have advisory boards with younger people make sure they're they're made up of diverse backgrounds I would encourage you to start like why do we need university education to have people in our businesses why can't we take people who have you know, left school at 18 and done a startup and had a whole bunch of different life experience or have done some form of apprenticeships. You know, I think we need to put people on the inside of companies who really understand the whole spectrum of what it is that we're trying to solve for. Um, Matthew Said's book, Rebel Ideas, is absolutely fantastic on this, where he talks about cognitive diversity and how do you drive cognitive diversity. And there's a whole bunch of examples in there of really famous world situations. Um, including things like September 11th of how CIA missed, missed that whole operation of, you know, cognitive bias. And so I would encourage people to read that book. Right. Well, I want to bring back, I, again, being an academic, I want to push the curriculum side a little bit. I'll try. Yeah. But, um, but you talked a little bit about yourself going in for impact. And is there not something to be done just as we position careers in STEM and tech as this stuff really draw? It's not just this geeky thing where you're going to go sit in a room and, and fiddle with technology, but this is a way to have impact. Does that resonate with you or? Yeah, I totally agree. So, so, so we talk, we talk about being impactful at Accenture and innovation all the time. It's actually what we live by. What do we mean by impact? So I think that's true. I think the other thing around STEM that's really important is making STEM attractive for girls, little girls at school, presenting that education course to them in a way that's not intimidating, that's not geared towards boys as it traditionally has been and reframing the content in a way that could be really attractive to young women or you know, people who feel differently about the world. I think it's also really important to your point on education. But you know, we, you know, one of the things that I think Accenture is most proud of in the last 12 months is we orchestrated the ventilator challenge in the UK to produce 15,000 ventilators to help more COVID patients uh, grieve when they're in hospital. Now we were a small part, you know, it was the Dysons and the McLarens and, you know, these amazing engineering companies who built the ventilators, but Accenture came forward and of course at no cost said, we want to facilitate this entire process. And the junior people in my innovation team who were working on that project, they were like, well, this is, this is what it's all about. You're having a direct impact in the world as it's happening. And more of those stories I think would really help. Great. Okay, thank you for that. A great, uh, oh, great way to open up this, this part of our Tech Talk series. I'm going to go to the questions now. So I'm yeah. going to fire some stuff at you. Just go deeper. Um, so first of all, Nick, you mentioned trial and error experimentation, really important. Um, what's your view on sort of machine learning, AI, big data as ways to de-risk um, experimentation and innovation? How are you oh, seeing know, those fields come together? Absolutely, without a doubt. I mean, you know, being able to take a huge amount of public data from social media and, you know, be able to predict the way consumers are potentially going to feel about something, you know, the ability to automate um, vast data lakes or amounts of information coming at you and understand really what is the insight that we're trying to innovate on. It's just so important. You know, I, we have a whole part of Accenture, which we call Industry X, which is all our manufacturing innovation what is happening in that sector is absolutely, you know, phenomenal and RPA and AI and automation are playing such a huge role um, 
in being able to deliver the sorts of solutions where we have totally modular production lines, where we have, you know, totally automated warehouses, where we're, you know, in the life sciences, I think in particular, COVID, the COVID vaccine has been one huge innovation sprint. It's completely broken the laws of how that industry would traditionally have operated with regulators and time to market and collaboration between competitors. And of course, that vaccine has essentially been data driven and there's absolutely no way that we would be where we are today without a huge amount of artificial intelligence and data there a hundred percent great amazing and i just to pick up on the second question from rashmi again a little bit from the uh from the the vaccine thing like, there were all these breaks it turns out in medical innovation that slowed the process down that turned out maybe didn't need to be could be managed better what about, so if we pivot to big companies, right? Yeah. One of the, they get often so many blocks from legal and risk and um, um, finance. Um, how, that's often, you know, not at the table. Um, what do you, what's, how do you try and help your clients navigate and avoid some of those blockers in their, their corporate processes and culture? Yeah, I mean, I don't think we want many more pandemics that are breaking the rules of society, but actually it's that out the box, unconstrained 10x thinking that can be applied to lots of other things that we're dealing with in the world, like the climate crisis, like the education crisis, like the hunger crisis, <laughs> that actually are crises that are just as pressing as the pandemic, they're just potentially not as visible right now. So there's something about that out of the box, unconstrained thinking. Um, and how do you have a systems thinking approach really to something to say like, you know, how is how, how do we need to solve this problem and what starting from a sort of what I call zero based approach to like, what are the processes we need to put in place to make sure this isn't a total disaster rather than what are all of the processes we have to take away to make this sort of 10% more fast or, or kind of less onerous. So I think about it that way, regardless of what policies you might have in place as a company, of course, which are all there for very good reason, you may have a breakthrough innovation or something that you're trying to solve in 10x thinking where you can start from zero base. And actually we do this quite a lot with banks, which you would traditionally say is well, surely, that's not, of course they're not gonna break any of their regulatory requirements, but actually saying, well, what are the regulations? What are the policies and what other things absolutely have to be in place to make sure we are compliant? And then what are the ones that we can put to one side and you know potentially leave till later? It's quite a liberating or exhilarating thing to do. So I'd encourage that. And I saw a comment in the questions earlier about they don't tend to find that it's legal and finance that are a problem, that they're not brought to the table. That I agree with. You've got to bring these people to the table really early on and you've got to hear their points of view because their points of view are very, very valid and they'll end up being very helpful in the success if you build their requirements in from day one and being able to talk to legal and finance and procurement about, tell me what we absolutely need to test as part of this experiment to satisfy you is a conversation that you can open up rather than them not being involved and then you getting to hour 10 and them saying well you haven't thought about any of these things so it's a no from us you know there's just it's a slight but very important difference there's still people right and they still exactly. appreciate being consulted for <laughs> example <laughs> surprise surprise Absolutely. exactly and if you uh, ask uh, them to help you break it down into experimentation I've actually never heard someone say no to that. Very good. Um, what do you think, again, you interact with lots of innovative companies. What are a few that are impressing you these days that you should, hey, watch watch these maybe European players that you're really starting to be proud and you, and of? And I think it doing. said not tech, didn't it? Um, yes, yes, yes. So not tech. So like, but like traditional players in Europe that are really getting their act together around innovation. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, there are companies like Orsted, the energy supplier in the Nordics, which are going to kind of completely changing the game in terms of sustainable technology driven innovation. L'Oreal, I think, is really impressive in terms of what they're doing in, in terms of their, their product innovation and e-commerce. I, you know, I said it earlier, I think um, what Bernard Looney at BP is doing is, inc you know, there are not many CEOs out there that are laying down a strategy that will only be successful far long after they are gone as CEO. And that takes real courage and real bravery. And he's had a real hammering in the press, press and from the investors, but investors are starting to turn. And I, 
I really believe what they're doing is incredibly worthwhile. So that's a few. And then in terms of industries, the life sciences industry is going through, I think, a real pivotal moment in turning from, you know, treating people for illnesses is good for us to preventing illness and keeping people healthy is good for us. And I think they'll end, you know, the, the good ones will end up on the right side of, of, of that argument. But, you know, the, new, the news just a few days ago about CRISPR is going to be completely groundbreaking for the world. And I'm extremely encouraged to see to see what they're doing. And actually, I think all of those companies have in common is they're putting data and, you know, those those tools we've talked about, AI and all of that kind of stuff at the core of how they're operating. And that's kind of one thing in common. Great thing about having an innovation person is you can ask them anything. So what's your view on blockchain? Again, I've heard you talk a lot about data and AI, talking about life sciences, CRISPR. Do you have a, a not, not a long treatise, but what's your line on blockchain as a driver, as an innovation opportunity these days? Well, I would say the first thing about it is we have to make it much more energy efficient, um, like to, by default, because it's, uh, it's kind of unworkable as it is at the moment. Um, but putting that aside, um, I like it as a multi-party system. I like it, I tell you the use cases I really like it, are trust and transparency. So if you think about sustainability and ESG, like being able to track the entire value chain in terms of your ESG footprint, how circular are you, how regenerative are you being at every stage of that, blockchain is a really wonderful solution to help with those kinds of questions. So I think in terms of trust and transparency, I think it's going to be potentially pivotal. We need to see some advancements in the technology. I think that the, the, the Bitcoin digital currency thing, I don't know whether I believe that that's just um, a bit of a kind of, um, you know, sidebar thing at this point or whether it's going to end up being a core part of how uh, DLT and blockchain work. But I think on the sustainability angle, we're starting to see some really impressive use cases for it. And I would encourage more investigation there. All right. Our, our time together is coming to an end. I'm just going to ask one last question um, around okay. learning, right? I, if, we, if I get a sense of you, you, you talked about how you've been driven by curiosity. Clearly, you talk about the importance of rapid learning um, for, for a successful innovation. What, what advice do you have on you know, how do you build organizations that are going to be good at learning, teams and individuals? Um, and, and any other closing thoughts you have for the group? Well, thank you. Firstly, it's been an absolute pleasure, Peter, and I always run over on our calls when we talk because we could be here all day. Um, in terms of the learning environment, I would say low ego. Uh, which is a hard one for some, yeah. some in companies. Humility, you've, humility, you've, humility. You've got to be low ego if you want to create a learning environment. And again, so, you know, part of what I do with my teams is I, I share what I le read, what I listen to um, and encourage people to do the same, like have curiosity time kind of built in and talk about that and have, so one of my performance expectations for my team is contributing to thought leadership and having C-suite advisory relationships that are kind of, you know, van impactful to use your word earlier. They can only do that if they're curious and they've got things to say. And so, you know, we try and lend it towards being something that's done. And I could talk for hours about Accenture at large, but I guess my cl closing comment would be, you know, um, podcasts are your friend, especially on a walk. Um, Masters of Scale by Reid Hoffman is absolutely brilliant if you're interested in this. The podcast by A16Z from Anderson Horowitz is also equally good. And if you haven't read, Tim Ferriss is very Marmite and people either love or hate him, but he has a book called Tools of Titans, which is a compilation of essays of sort of the best advice that he's been given by all of these people that he has interviewed. And it's, it's absolutely sensational. So those would be my closing recommendations to try and be uh, helpful. But thank you, Peter. It's absolutely charming as always. Thank you, Lucy, for being with us. Thank you for sharing what's on your mind. And thank you for being just an outstanding role model of, of women in tech and just driving innovation in Europe and beyond. Thank you for your time. Take care, everyone.